This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. In the book, Silver Trumpet, there's an account of a young boy who was walking back to his hotel in New York after after he had seen the New York Yankees play baseball. As he walked along the streets, he heard from somewhere the faint sounds of somebody playing a piano. Somehow he could not explain he was drawn to this music. You can imagine his surprise when he found out that the music came from a large tent on the front of which was a sign with huge letters said, Revival Meeting, Everyone Welcome. Well, the young man felt that he must see who was playing that piano, so he went inside and cautiously took his seat on the back row. After the music was over, a white-haired man arose, and the boy started to leave, but somehow he hesitated. The old minister began in a very quiet, calm voice, to say something like this. If I were to give each of you a clean piece of white paper, a pencil, and 30 seconds in which to write, how would you complete this sentence? For me to live is, and then blank. Would you say for me to live is pleasure? For me to live is wealth? For me to live is fame? For me to live is my family. Uh, For me to live is getting along with other people. Could it possibly be that you might honestly say, as did the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ? Well, if I were to give each of you here at Ocean Lakes Worship Service this morning that same test, the pencil, the piece of paper, the same question, what would your answer be? What would you write? Well, I really don't, uh, I don't really want you to answer that question yet. Let's wait until we're through, and then you may have a more accurate answer. Much of what your answer will be will depend on what you think of life itself. What is life anyway? Even an abridged dictionary gives 12 different definitions of the word life. The biologist says that life is the quality of an organism in which its organs are capable of performing their functions. A philosopher says, a little work, a little sleep, a little love, and it's all over. Another person says, life is a quarry out of which we're able to mold and chisel and complete a character. The Arab says, life is composed of two parts, the past, a dream, the future, a wish. Henry Ward Beecher said it this way, age and youth (coughs) look upon life from the opposite ends of a telescope. To the youth, it's very long. To age, it is exceedingly short. (coughs) Of course, we know there are several attitudes that one can take toward life and living. The coward would come along and say, well, what a terrible world I live in. Nothing I can do about it. I'm just going to drift along with the crowd. And you know the approach of the ostrich. He says, I don't see anything wrong. Every day and every way, the world's getting better and better. But the Christian takes yet another approach to life, a different view. The Christian would say, yes, this world is pretty bad, but thanks be to God who put me here to do my part to make it right. James Russell Lowell in his poem said it this way, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet the scaffold always sways the future and beyond the dim unknown standeth God among the shadows keeping watch above his own. What does it mean to you if you say, for me to live is Christ? Well, first it means that you're willing to follow Jesus, adapting your pattern of life after his pattern of life. 
means you want to find out what God's will is you for to do in certain circumstances. And then when you know what he wants you to do, then you want to do that very same thing. You'll have a desire to imitate Jesus in your life. Do you remember years ago when we first all began to have televisions? We didn't have cable television back in those days or all the ways of getting a TV signal in our homes. We had television antennas on the roofs. That's the only way you could get it. I heard a story some time ago about a windstorm that broke off one arm of an antenna that was, motiv that was mounted on the roof of a house where there was a, a TV repairman lived. He had put it up there. He knew about how to, establish, how to fix that antenna. And although with a broken arm off the antenna, it stopped giving as strong a signal as in the past, it did work partly. And the repairman was so busy fixing other customers' televisions, he never got around to repairing his own antenna on his house. Well, when one of the neighbors got ready to put up a new antenna for his house, a nearby neighbor, he decided he was going to install his own antenna rather than hiring somebody else or rather than imposing on his TV repairman neighbor. He didn't know a lot about television or certainly not about television antenna, but he determined that he was just going to duplicate the one that his TV repairman neighbor had. So very carefully he drilled the lead-in hole in the same spot, secured the base, turned it in the identical direction, and then studying very carefully his neighbor's antenna one more time, he reached up and yanked off one arm of his brand new antenna. Now it was exactly like the one his neighbor had. Only problem was he had imitated its faults as well as its virtues. Following Christ means that we'll pattern our lives after him because he is the only one who is worthy of our allegiance, our following saying to live as Christ means following him whether or not you see the way clearly. Stonewall Jackson once said of his leader, Robert E. Lee, he is the only man I would follow blindfolded. Sometimes in church we sing the hymn, wherever he leads I'll go. But then when it comes to the act of going, we sing another song, others, Lord, yes, others. You remember when uh, in the earlier days of night, late night talk show, uh, even way back before Johnny Carson, uh, David Letterman were there. One of the earlier ones was a man whose name was Jack Parr. Some of you remember him. Well, one night when Jack Parr was the MC of the Tonight Show, he was discussing the work of Albert Schweitzer, missionary doctor in Africa. Before he was 30 years old, Schweitzer had earned doctorates in philosophy, theology, medicine, and music. And Jack Parr was expressing his admiration, appreciation for this man, who was also a famed concert pianist. And for the fact that he would give his life in a remote corner of Africa, Schweitzer would, when he might have received the accolades of the whole world if he'd stayed in America. Well, after a long pause, Jack Parr uttered these very significant words. He said, you know, I'd like to be an Albert Schweitzer if I could commute. Well, that's the way a lot of people think. I'll do great things for God if I can reserve this area of life for myself. If I can continue to do things the way I want to do them. Those who try to make their faith a part-time, half-measure hobby rather than a total commitment of life. These will go away from Christ unhappy like the rich young ruler did. When a person says for me to live is Christ, it means you'll do all within your power to make Jesus your Lord in your daily life. The oldest creed known in all Christendom is three words. Christ is Lord. And the Greek is just two. Christos Kyrios. Those who have studied the history of our nation may remember the words spoken by General Pershing to the commander-in-chief of the Allied armies in World War I. Pershing saluted sharply and said, Infantry, artillery, navy, aviation, all that we have is yours. Dispose of them as you will. 
in the life of the one who's seeking to make Jesus Christ the commander in chief of his life, his Lord. There's a desire to stand before him and say, arms, mind, tongue, talents, time, Lord, all that I have is yours. Dispose of them as you will. The beautiful truth behind this commitment is the fact that when we do this, then God has something special for each one of us to do. The poet has said it this way, the Lord, he had a job for me, but I had so much to do, I said, you get somebody else or wait till I get through. I didn't know how the Lord came out, but he seemed to get along. And yet I, feel, I felt so sneaking like I'm doing God or wrong. One day I needed the Lord, needed him right away, but he never answered me at all. Yet I could hear him say down in my guilty heart, man, I got so much to do. You get somebody else or wait till I get through. Now, when the Lord has a job for me, I never try to shirk. I drop the thing I have on hand and do the good Lord's work. And my affairs can run along or wait till I get through because nobody else can do the job the Lord's marked out for you. To say for me to live as Christ means that we'll make a conscious decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God and let him have his way with us. A young man who was struggling to let the Lord have his way in his life knelt to pray. He had been told to let God and, uh, go. Uh, let God do the work for you. But as he was kneeling, he said to himself, I want to let God, but I can't do it. The day before, he had cut out from the cardboard the letters, let God, and had stuck these individual letters on the wall in his room. Rising from his position of prayer on his knees, this young man had a feeling of utmost despair and defeat. As he left the room, he slammed the door, glancing up at the two words he had just pasted on the wall. And he said to himself, I just can't let God. Sometime later, when he returned to his room, he was shocked to see inside that when he slammed the door, the force of closing that door had loosened one of the letters he'd pasted on the wall. It had fallen to the floor. The letter that had come loose and had fallen was the letter D on the word God. Now, as he looked up at the two words, they had an entirely different reading. Now it said, let go. It was a real revelation to him. As he saw for the first time, it was not his ability, not his own strength that was important. It was rather he needed to make that surrender of his life to let go. And then he could let God do for him what he could not do for himself. Whatever your situation is, God is using the means right now to speak to your heart personally. Maybe that you do know Jesus as your Savior. You have had time in the past. You've invited him to come in and take control of the throne of your life. Even though your name is on the roll of a church somewhere, you're not satisfied with your life, perhaps. Something not all right is going on inside. You're not really happy with the relationship with Christ you're now experiencing. If that's your case in His great, wonderful, loving way, the Lord can take that part of your life that is not right, and He can restore you to where you ought to be. But for Him to do this, you must come to the place when you're ready to say, Yes, Lord. I want you to have my heart, my life. I read some time ago a story of a man who went to a watchmaker and took with him the hands of a clock. He said to the repairman, here, I want you to fix these hands from my clock. They just have not kept the, kept the wreck time for about six months. The watchmaker said, well, where's the clock? The man said, well, I left it back at my house. <laughs> watchmaker said, but friend, I've got to have the clock if you expect me to get it running right again. man said, no, you don't understand. There's nothing wrong with my clock. It's these hands that give the wrong time. The hands don't work, so I brought them to you. I've got you figured out, fella. You just want me to bring the whole clock in so you can tinker around with it and charge me a big price. Here, give me back those hands. I'll go somewhere else and get those hands fixed. That's all that's wrong with my clock, my hands. Well, 
we can all see this is foolishness indeed, but it is no more foolish than the person who says, my life is not what it ought to be. I want to give God a part of me. I want to make him, I want him to make everything right again. These people give the same excuse that man with the broken clock gave. They're afraid the price will be too great. But God is not interested in doing just a halfway job for us. He wants to get things right completely. And yet we say, Lord, if you'll just get me out of this tight spot, if you'll just fix this one part of my life, if you'll just let me tell you what I want done with this phase of my life. But the master workman says, no, I cannot regulate the hands unless I have the heart. For me to live is, what would you put in that blank line? What's your answer to that question? The way you and I answer that question right now will be a true index of our genuine love for the Lord. Heavenly Father, we confess that our love has been partial, has not been full and complete as you want it to be. You love us unconditionally, but we love you the way we want to love you and give you the part of our life that we want to give you. Help us, O oh Lord, to be willing to say, wherever he leads, I'll go. My life, my heart, my all, I bring to Christ who loves me so. May we do that now, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.